Thank you everyone for your time today. Just a quick recap of our agenda. We're gonna be starting talking off, talking about some of the challenges the data science teams face and how our studio products can help tackle those challenges and how those challenges then help drive people to consider moving to the cloud. And so then we'll talk about some of the different cloud options that are out there, hosted services, working with a VPC um, provider such as Azure AWS, cloud marketplace offerings and doing data science in your data lake. And then I'll hand off to Kevin for to do a deep dive on some of the factors that you should consider when you are considering deploying your software uh, to a VPC. Then we'll wrap up and have time for as many questions as we can. And as Sam said, any questions we don't get to today, we'll have a follow-up thread on our community site um, to continue the discussion there. So we've talked to many data science teams in a large variety of organizations over the years. And what we've heard from many of them is that a lot of data science teams fail to live up to their full promise of what they're trying to achieve, what the, what the organization is hoping, the value that the organization is hoping to get from this team. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, and these reasons tend to group, uh, based on our conversations, with again, many data science teams tend to group into a few different areas. Perhaps teams have trouble creating insights. Perhaps they have trouble once they have actually created those insights to actually use those insights to impact decision making in the organization. Because ultimately, you know, if you've got a better way to do things or a better way to make a decision, it only actually matters if that gets implemented and that actually impacts your organization. Or sometimes uh, teams have the greatest challenges around actually maintaining and improving this value over time, that they get some insights, they create decision-making, but then it fades. Maybe they find it difficult to maintain. So there are many different reasons, many different uh, challenges that go into these different areas and things that teams need to overcome. Today, we're gonna be focusing on this third column. Um, that silo teams lead to often redundant work, make collaboration difficult. They may spend too much time maintaining tools or too much time rerunning analyses because teams can't easily deploy self-service applications. Or perhaps it takes too much manual effort to deploy and maintain these systems. And I'm focusing on these because these are the items that are often addressed by centralizing your data science and or moving it to the cloud. So what we found is that customers who have successfully scaled their data science team and the work that they do and impacted their organization tend to focus on three key attributes of their data science environment, open source, code oriented, and centralized. And again, in this session, we'll focus on the centralized and cloud aspect. Um, open source, of course, is a key part of our studio's mission and we find it critical because it eases recruiting and retention and training for new people and it's comprehensive and interoperable. Code oriented is a key part of our studio's philosophy of data science because code is flexible. It doesn't have black box constraints and code by its nature is easy to iterate and reuse and extend and inspect. But again, in this session, we'll focus on the centralized and cloud aspects because centralizing your data science helps reduce unnecessary work for the data science team, makes it easier to collaborate across that team providing a common way of deploying self-service applications to your stakeholders helps inform them and helps drive decision making and impact that in the organization and of course if you're working with open source tools like r and python finding some consistent way to manage all the data science packages and manage the versions of that is critical and often that's easiest if you centralize that so that it's common across both your development and deployment environments Now, these three key aspects, um, open source, code oriented, and centralized, are key aspects of what we call serious data science. And we call this serious data science because this approach typically enables a data scientist to tackle the complex, difficult, and at least initially often ill-defined problems that can really provide value and novel insights in an organization. Now, the two leading languages in open source data science are, of course, R and Python. Um, but on their own, R and Python certainly provide the open source and code oriented aspects, but they don't out of the box on their own uh, make it easy to centralize your data science or deploy it to the cloud. And that's where our studio's commercial products come in. 
Our products support the development and deployment of data science with both R and Python. And we have a modular platform called R Studio Team that helps you centralize your data science in an enterprise-friendly way, providing security and scalability, et cetera. And so let's just talk about that briefly. Um, now, what's, what does a data science team actually need to do? Well, there's two things that they typically need to do in part of their work. They need to create insights, and then they need to find a way of sharing those insights to impact decision-making in the organization. And so typically when they create insights, insights, they're using some sort of data science workbench, some way uh, where they can use their IDE of choice, whether it's Jupyter Notebooks or our, the R Studio IDE uh, or VS Code, you know, all in a single location, use those different um, uh, development environments to create various data products using R and Python. These, these typically are tailored applications or reports or APIs. We call these tailored because they're not off the shelf. They're not block black box, but they're focused on the problem at hand, focused on providing the exact information that a decision maker needs in their day-to-day -day work. And that's one of the big advantages, of course, of a code-oriented approach. You don't have any arbitrary limitations. You can focus on what your stakeholders need. And of course, once they create these interactive applications or reports or APIs, they need a way of publishing them, a way of sharing them. And so typically they can publish these to a deployment portal. And once this is available in a deployment portal, the data science team can now share these insights to impact decision-making. And this typically takes the form of an interactive web application, say a Shiny application um, that can be shared with a decision-maker or an automated email report that can be sent to the decision-maker with um, the analysis right within it so they have that data within their in inbox. Or perhaps they create APIs uh, that can be integrated into other systems for automated decision making. And it's critical for both these areas, for both the development side and the deployment side, that you have a way of managing your open source packages because this eases maintenance and reproducibility. And this, of course, is where our products come in. Our Studio Server Pro provides that centralized data science workbench with a variety of different uh, development environments. Our Studio Connect provides that. Deployment portal where you can share your applications and APIs with your decision makers and other systems. And these may take the form of Shiny, our Markdown, Plumber APIs, also a number of different Python um, frameworks that we, that we support, things like Streamlit and Bokeh. And it's critical for both of these that you have a way of managing packages. And that's where our Studio Package Manager comes in. And it's these three products, our Studio Server Pro, Connect, and Package Manager that make up our RStudio team uh, bundle. And of course, it's critical that this all integrates with standard systems in your organization. Kevin will be talking a lot more about a few of these, especially Kubernetes moving forward. But the critical idea here is there's a lot of benefits to centralizing your data science. And many, many of our customers do exactly this um, you know, on-prem. And so the question is, what then drives people to want to go to the cloud? There are several different reasons. Um, often uh, a key reason is simply simplifying and reducing the startup cost for a new data science team. That when someone, when an organization is spinning up a new team, cloud is often a way to really get that team, get the resources that team needs going quickly. Perhaps they want to make collaboration or instruction, say workshops or classes between organizations or groups easier. Cloud's a great way of doing that. Perhaps they want to mitigate the high costs of maintaining their own computing infrastructure. This was one of the you know, primary drivers originally for uh, organizations to move to the cloud and is still you know, a major factor. Closely aligned to that is scaling to meet variable demand that if your, the demand for your computations, for your data science uh, computations is highly variable, you don't want to keep a bunch of expensive computing infrastructure um, sitting around idle. Instead, you want to push that responsibility out to the cloud provider to maintain that for you. And finally, if your data is already in the cloud, um, then you want to reduce time and costs in moving the data to your analysis. And rather than pulling it down locally to do data science, it's often much more efficient and much less expensive to do that data science up on the cloud directly right in your data lake. So let's talk about a few of these different options. 
Um, again, one of the most common options is doing a hosted uh, um, uh, service where a vendor provides software as a service. We talked about a couple of things our studio does there. The other very common way of doing this is deploying to a virtual private cloud provider, such as Azure or AWS. And I'll be touching on that lightly here, but Kevin will be covering that in a lot more detail in the next section. Third and closely aligned is cloud marketplace offerings. Again, that's very similar in some ways to deploying to a VPC. You're running on the cloud provider's hardware, um, but here typically it's easier to start up and it's, it's done on an hourly basis. And finally, data science in a data lake, um, such as Qball or Databricks. So hosted software as service offerings, some of the things that really make these offerings great are they're easy to quickly start up and they streamline collaboration. If the members of your team can simply go in, put a credit card in and sign up for a few dollars a month to access some capabilities, that's an easy way to scale up very quickly. Now, sometimes software as a service may have limited functionality compared to on-prem. Um, so you might not have the full options that you would have if you uh, were to install locally. And sometimes, again, depending on the service, integration with your data internal systems could be more challenging or perhaps not even possible. So a couple of offerings that our studio has in this arena. We have our Studio Cloud, which is a hosted version of the RStudio Server Pro uh, with the RStudio IDE. Makes it easy for anybody to do or share or teach or learn data science using just your web browser. So the initial focus right now for our Studio Cloud is primary, primarily for platform as a platform for instructor-led education. So if you are doing a workshop in your commercial organization or if you are teaching a class on data science or statistics at the university level, our Studio Cloud is a great solution for that. And we have many organizations using it for that already. Another great uh, um, focus for our Studio Cloud right now is enabling academic research by sharing among different groups. This is a handy way of doing that. And there's a lot more um, that we'll be rolling out in our Studio Cloud over the next several months. So some of the great benefits of our Studio Cloud, again, nothing to install locally. All you need is a browser. You can share projects that you create there with your team or a class or workshop. And again, nothing to configure, no hardware installation or anything like that, just a month-to-month -month, uh, purchase. And there's various plans available for our Studio Cloud, uh, including uh, free to get started. Shiny Apps IO is another hosted service our studio provides. This is a way of securely and scalably sh sharing your, hosted, your Shiny applications on a hosted service. And so if you have a Shiny application that you want to share with the world or with a much smaller group, um, you can do that quickly on shinyapps.io. Um, again, various plans available there, including free to get started. You can visit shinyapps.io to learn more. The second major area of uh, cloud, um, second major way of going to the cloud is deploying to a virtual private cloud provider like AWS or Azure or Google Cloud Platform. Now, some of the advantages of this is that you can pay as you go for the compute resources specifically. Typically, if you're deploying um, to a VPC, you've purchased the license from the vendor already, um, though not necessarily, it depends on the offering. Um, another great advantage here, you get the full functionality of the on-premise software, because typically it is the on-premise software or a close variant of that that's available um, on the uh, VPC. So for example, right now, our Studio Cloud doesn't yet have the ability to uh, provide our uh, Jupyter Notebooks um, in that environment. That's you know one of the things we're working on for the future. But right now, if you were to deploy our Studio Server Pro to a VPC, you'd have the full functionality being able to um, uh, utilize Jupyter Notebooks and Jupyter Lab through the same capabilities that you could use the RStudio IDE. VPCs also give you access to specialized hardware like GPUs. Now on the con side, it can be difficult to maintain. There's typically more administration overhead. There's a complexity of things like Kubernetes that you um, might need to consider. And Kevin is gonna be discussing all this in, in a lot more detail in the next section. The other challenge around VPCs is that the cost can be high and variable. That you need to really manage the compute cost closely to make sure the software is only available when it's needed. Otherwise it can keep running in the background and rack up your uh, 
uh, comp, comp view charges. Third, and again closely related, is cloud marketplace offerings. Uh, going instead of uh, installing on your own on a VPC, you go to the AWS or Azure or GCP cloud marketplaces uh, to spin up software from a vendor. Our studio has um, offerings on all those marketplaces. It's very handy in a lot of ways because it's easy to get started quickly, makes it great for proof of concepts. You're paying as you go typically for both compute and software licenses uh, on an hourly basis. Again, very inexpensive to get started. And again, access to the specialized hardware. But like deploying to a VPC, you need to make sure you carefully manage the software to make sure it's only when running when you need it. Otherwise, you could run into excessive hourly charges, which means often, not always, but often this is best for short-term projects, especially if you're collaborating between organizations, because that's a great way to provide access outside your uh, organization. And then finally, data science in your data lake. Great example of a data lake is someone like Qball, a partner um, for our studio. Qball provides um, a data lake with our Studio Server Pro capabilities built into it. And some of the you know, advantages here is you can minimize the overhead by running your computations close to the data, um, avoiding the cost of moving the data um, from you know, one cloud to another or down um, locally. It also makes it easy to incorporate data science directly into your data pipeline. Now on the con side, running your data science in your data lake can add some technical complexity, can make it a little bit more difficult to do what you wanna do, or at least a little bit more complicated. And again, you might run into some functionality limitations here uh, that could be challenging, depending on what the data lake provider and the data science provider uh, have done and how they're working together um, technically. So to sum up this section, um, ultimately, it really depends on what your primary goal is. Um, and based on your primary goal, you can different ways of going to the cloud. Your primary goal is to really minimize cost and maintenance and startup time. Then using a hosted service is often a great uh, way to start there, especially if you have a small team or really just an individual data scientist. If you want the full flexibility of an on-prem solution, all the bells and whistles, all the capabilities, but without maintaining your own hardware, but still having the flexibility to scale, then deploying to a VPC um, provider is often the best way to go. Kevin will be talking more about that next. If you're doing something that's much more short-term, perhaps just a proof of concept, you don't wanna to commit to a long time period, uh, offerings on a cloud marketplace by the hour, are often a great way to do that. And again, if your biggest concern is your data is already in the cloud and you want to minimize um, the overhead of moving that data someplace else to analyze it, then often data science in your data lake is going to be the best approach. So with that, I'll hand you off to Kevin. Thank you, Lou, for that really good introduction. Um, Really appreciate that uh, presentation. So uh, I want to talk about uh, more along the lines of why wh why you might want to move to cloud and what are some of the key considerations that people have when they move to cloud. Um, so this is a big decision for a lot of organizations to either switch from their on-premise uh, history or or maybe just expanding their, their cloud footprint for the data science teams. Um, so next slide. There we go. <clears throat> so typically when we uh, meet with clients and we're discussing cloud infrastructure for uh, various different data science applications and primarily a lot of the time we're speaking about our studio team installations and configurations. Uh, we're considering uh, a lot of different things and the key kind of facts that come up, the key uh, recurring themes that we see coming up are, you know, first of all, assessing the needs of the team, you know, how big is their team? How much do they, power do they need? And do they really need the cloud? Do they need to utilize the cloud's immense scale? And do they see a lot of potential future growth or unforeseen growth in the future? So do they need to be able to scale their, their uh, resources over time in an unpredictable manner? And this is where cloud is really uh, powerful um, it's quite easy or relatively easy to configure your environments to scale over time 
uh, if you understand where your team is going and what your needs are going to be. Uh, another key thing is, you know, how am I going to control the costs? So with infinite scale comes infinitely scaling bills. So uh, this is a big concern, as as Lou alluded to. It's a pay-as-you-go model, but um, unfortunately that means if you use lots and lots of resources, you're going to get charged from lots of resources. So uh, controlling costs is a very key consideration. It's uh, much more straightforward to control those costs when you when you uh, are the ones maintaining the physical infrastructure because you've got a very defined view of what it can be. Um, but when you're dealing with virtually unlimited resources, um, your bills can get out of hand quite quickly. So there's different ways that you can mitigate against that. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. <clears throat> Another key consideration, we work with a lot of clients in uh, more regulated industries, uh, whether they're working in industries with uh, proprietary information or maybe they're working in industries where they handle a lot of very sensitive data around uh, customers. So PII that you know is maybe needs to be treated with a high degree of sensitivity. And this is a, a, this is a, a consideration, a key consideration that maybe slows up the adoption of cloud over time. Um, so typically these industries are are lagging behind the more uh, versatile or the more uh, the more the, the tech industries that are maybe able to move a little quicker on these don't have these uh, regulations that they need to consider. And so they often ask, you know, can I how can I secure my cloud? And uh, the answer really is uh, as secure as you want to make it. And we can dive a little bit more deep into that in a in a few minutes. Uh, another key consideration is, of course, you're handing over the keys of your infrastructure to a cloud provider. And, um, you know, if you go back as far as uh, the early noughties and the tech boom, and there was plenty of websites that were being hosted by young entrepreneurs in in their in their uh, home offices or their bedrooms, little computers that they put under desks, and they were hosting websites that way. But um, with the immense scale of these uh, these uh, cloud infrastructure companies, um, they're much more sophisticated organizations. and uh, while you're handing over the keys to them and they're managing the physical uh, security of your infrastructure, um, they're they're able to benefit from that massive scale to really secure their infrastructure in a way that uh, is quite difficult to do. And so we can uh, talk a bit more about that. And then the last one, and this kind of ties back to our, our first point with, uh, re with regards to scale, and that is how do I adapt to change and how easy is it to do that? Um, you know, if if I architect a solution and I build it and all of a sudden I see a, a huge uptick in usage and how can I make sure that uh, we can scale our, our environment for our teams in an efficient manner so that we don't see any downtime or we don't have very lengthy delays between uh, making more resources available. And again, this is somewhere where cloud can really excel if you, if you know what you're doing. So yeah, thank you. You can go to the next slide, Lou. So, when we initially engage with our, our clients, one of the uh, first things we, we like to, to talk to them about um, is we carry out a series of interviews with their key users and the business users to try and get a better understanding uh, across all the different products that they're trying to uh, embed in their team. So uh, as Lou mentioned, RStudio Pro for the data scientists, the people who are doing the development work, uh, RStudio Connect, you know, the platform for sharing that information with the users and Pac-Man for uh, sharing the, <coughs> sorry, for controlling the, managing the uh, IT kind of security and package management. <coughs> so uh, I, I put together this small matrix just to kind of uh, give a, a of some of those considerations that we'd, we'd like to take into account. So we're looking to understand, you know, let's say if we take, for example, our Studio Pro, how big is their team? How many, what's the makeup of the team, the context of the team? Is there a lot of data scientists, people running a lot of simulations? Uh, how variable are their workloads? What's the kind of size of data they're dealing with? Are they dealing with very small data, you know, in the order of megabytes? Or they're really a big data shop who are dealing with petabytes or terabytes of data. And also the size of the team definitely matters, right? If you've got a very small team, if you've got a team of five people, um, you know, you could probably handle your workloads in a, a much more simple uh, architecture. But as you scale up your team or you scale up the size of your data, you, you might want to consider more complex approaches. And that's uh, where Lou was alluding to earlier with the clustered uh, approach with Kubernetes. <clears throat> and so I've, I've kind of broken it up here and you can think about, and this is definitely a rule of thumb. And 
you know, your mileage may vary, as they say, and this all comes out of a result of a series of interviews with your team and understanding your needs. Um, but smaller teams, more simple teams will benefit from a simpler approach, and those are the ones in the yellow zone. So if you're dealing with relatively small teams uh, with relatively small amounts of data, uh, you could probably get away with a more basic or simple approach. Again, taking into consideration how variant is the workloads in those teams. You know, are you seeing a, a large differentiation and uh, making architecture that works for those as well. And the same with the red zone. You know, if you're dealing with very large sets of data or very large teams, um, you're definitely going to want to consider a more complex approach because uh, it's just harder to predict what your teams are going to be able to do. So you're maybe going to want to work with a more scalable solution, uh, something that can flex with the needs of your team over time. And then if you're sitting in that orange area, again, you're, you're, you're going to have to think a little harder about uh, what kind of workloads you're running how predictable are they and you know you might be some, sitting somewhere in between the the more simple approaches or the more complex approaches depending on uh, the type of work that your team does um yes uh you can go to the next slide lou so there are a number of different solutions that you can uh, implement in the cloud to to uh, implement your architecture from the very simple uh, to the more complex uh, as Alou alluded to, there there is something like a quick start image for most uh, cloud providers in in AWS, and I've provided some AWS analogous uh, uh, examples throughout this presentation. In AWS, we have something called an Amazon machine image, and this is just a pre-configured image where you can quickly spin up the machine and test out test it out. And so this is better for maybe short-term projects, or where we typically recommend this be used is in cases where people really just want to kind of play around with RStudio and see is it uh, worth investing their time into. Um, so they can quickly launch it and test it out and get it up and running without too much work. Um, so this is a good for a prototyping phase or just kind of seeing what RStudio is all about if you're maybe new to that or you're maybe new to cloud and seeing does it work well with your different systems. Uh, but it comes at a bit of a premium and so as Lou was saying, you probably want to make sure you don't leave it on all the time. You're going to get charged by the hour for your machine and the license fees. And really, if you're going to go ahead and deploy our studio in a truly productionized manner in a serious enterprise situation, uh, you're going to want to consider one of the other options. And so the simplest approach you can take is a virtual machine uh, deployed on a VPC. <clears throat> in AWS, uh, they have something called the Elastic Complete Cloud, and that's their virtual machine uh, deployment. And so EC2 instances, as they're called, uh, you can go ahead and pick all the RAM and CPU requirements that you need. Uh, pick the right OS. That can be a very important consideration for some teams. If you need a Red Hat Linux uh, environment, or do you need a, or can you are you okay with an open source environment like Ubuntu? Uh, you want to consider then: Do you want to be highly available or not? And if you need double redundancy, this is this is something we often recommend if people are working in the cloud. Is our studio has a built-in load balancer that will distribute traffic evenly across the different machines if you've got multiple machines running. Uh, but you can implement some double redundancy, which is super important for a lot of teams to make sure that if the master node goes down, you don't lose access to your environment. And so we use load balancers in the cloud and every, every major cloud provider has some version of this. And this ultimately allows for us to scale our resources vertically. Um, so we can, or you know, you can actually scale it out horizontally as well. But typically, if you're doing that, uh, we recommend the next approach, which is Kubernetes. So, just for those who may be uninitiated, you know, scaling vertically will be just increasing the the amount of RAM or CPU that your machine has, uh, versus scaling horizontally is simply adding more of the same machine. Um, but if you're going to go with that approach, we recommend going with a cluster approach. So if you've got a larger team and you've got variable workloads. Uh, you might want to consider using something like Kubernetes. And so again, every cloud provider has their own version of this. Uh, on Amazon, they've got a managed service called Amazon EKS or Amazon Elastic Kubernetes Service. And this is really great for enterprises that have variable workloads. And also, if you want to version control your, your environment, uh, you can use Docker to containerize your solutions, your environment, and uh, scale this infinitely to your team's needs. So uh, if your team grows, uh, you just configure your cluster to grow with your team and again utilize those load balancers. The final one here that I want to point out and that's an inbuilt feature that's come out in our studio in the last couple of years that uh, 
some people may be aware of, and that's a Server Pro Launcher, and this integrates well with Kubernetes. So uh, what this allows you to do is, within your regular environment, so maybe you've got pretty low uh, compute needs on an everyday basis within your team, um, so maybe you don't need an EKS environment, uh, maybe you're okay with an EC2 instance, but every once in a while you want the ability to be able to scale up your jobs to a much larger scale. And so that's where Job Launcher can be really effective and allowing power users to run those heavy workloads without bringing to a halt the, the uh, base instances. So if you've got a team of 10 data scientists, they're all working and they're using their EC2 instances and somebody wants to run a really heavy uh, model training or simulation, uh, they can utilize this job launcher and not take down or tank the entire uh, EC2 instance for everybody else. And so it isolates that workload from everybody else in the team. Uh, you can go to the next slide. So uh, pay as you go, uh, only pay for what you use. This is uh, one of the great benefits of cloud, but only if you do it right. Uh, you can definitely get this wrong and end up with a big unexpected bill. So some of the common mistakes that people uh, see is you over provision your resource. And this comes down to poor planning. So you over over uh, estimate your needs and you essentially just by some percentage amount um, uh, overspend or have a, have machines set up, uh, an architecture set up that is maybe just a little bit too much for what you actually needed. And uh, you can scale that down then if you're monitoring that well. Uh, another one is poor limit planning. So, you know, most cloud providers will allow you to set limits on your spend or limits on uh, how big you want your clusters to get or limits on what machines are, different people are allowed to use and stuff like that. And so <clears throat> if you're not planning that out or if you're not utilizing it at all, um, like I say with clusters, the cluster will grow to as big of a need as the team use. So if you've got a team of data scientists and uh, you don't have any limits set and they get carried away with themselves, uh, you could end up with a very large bill at the end of the month. And the last one, as uh, Lou alluded to, is uh, shutting down those unused resources. Um, so it, what we see in a lot of teams is uh, they use, you know, Elastic MapReduce or they use clusters. And the analysts will turn on their clusters and do their analysis, but they'll forget to t shut it off. So uh, if they're not using scalable infrastructure and they're they're setting up a lot of lot of expensive machines and they leave it running overnight you know that can be a pretty hefty bill in the morning um for somebody if they forgot to turn things off so you can you can definitely mitigate against these uh, problems so you can be very thoughtful and uh, plan about planning your architecture and this is something where we really work a lot with our clients on and making sure that uh, we spend a lot of time in the planning phase you know we're not rushing into implementing the solutions we really want to make sure that the solution that we're architecting for them is right for them now and right for them six months from now. So it's the right mix of balancing for what they need today, but also taking into consideration what are they going to need in the future. Uh, make sure you're utilizing those budgets and monitoring and alerts. Uh, be very clever about that and utilize that to the max because that's going to help prevent any unexpected builds or any surprises. Uh, categorize your spends. Make sure that you know if you are overspending, you're able to easily pinpoint where in your system you're you're overspending so you can you know isolate that offending uh, uh instance or or cluster and make mitigating actions to that and of course you need to regularly reassess so you know you can plan as much as you want but your team's needs are going to change over time maybe your team grows or maybe your team is downsizing a little bit and you can you know you can go with a smaller uh, instance size but you need to regularly come back to that uh, you can go to the next slide. The next key question is how secure is the cloud? And like I said earlier, it can really be as secure as you want it to be. So a lot of people will think, oh, well, if I have my physical infrastructure in-house on the premise, that's the most secure I can be. But I mean, that's not always the case because you've got to pay for uh, the security within your own premise. You've got to pay for security guards if you're really con concerned about people coming in and doing harm to your infrastructure. Uh, you got to maintain that infrastructure uh, and you got to maintain all the firewalls and security around that. If you work with the cloud, um, Amazon in their shared responsibility model or different uh, cloud providers, they will maintain the security and uh, integrity of those physical machines. And they provide all of the software that you need, that you could possibly need to configure the security. So really, it can be as secure as you want it to be. And that 
is a real caveat because you need to make sure that you're configuring your 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 you're configuring your solutions to be as secure as your requirements might be. So if you have a very high security need, you need to scale up your investment in your uh, architecture appropriately. And in different uh, cloud providers, and you know, I'm going to use AWS again as an example, you've got different resources. So you can have a VPC that's completely private with subnets that are completely private or or maybe completely public or maybe a mix of the two. And you can have different instances in each uh, environment that can speak to each other across using what are, what are known as an Amazon, an Amazon resource name. But every, again, in every cloud provider, you've got this ability to allow services to talk to each other without having humans have access to those services. So this is really powerful if you want to utilize like serverless technology, maybe have an entry point that a human can interact with, but the underlying hardware or data or infrastructure, they can't access. It's only the actual services on AWS that they do have access uh, that can do that. Um, so if you go to the next slide, we can see an example of that. And this is just an example where you've got two VPCs, you know, they're private subnets inside of them. Ordinarily, these two instances shouldn't be able to interact with each other. Uh, but again, Amazon provides the software you can use this VPC peering connection and make sure that these instances are now able to communicate with each other. So a malicious actor could not communicate with these private subnets or the private instances, uh, but you can actually configure these services to be able to talk to each other. And that can be really powerful and important for a lot of use cases and uh, making sure that your different systems across your organization are able to talk to each other without compromising security. Uh, you can go to the next slide. <coughs> Again, just to point out, this is a, an example here of the AWS shared responsibility model. And just really to point out that it's up to your organization to configure a, a secure environment. So that's your portion of the shared responsibility model. AWS will provide and maintain uh, the software and hardware needed to, to uh, do all that. But you need, you need to take responsibility for making sure that uh, your uh, privacy and security is meeting your requirements. So if you're from a, a highly regulated in industry, you need to consider that. There's also some government cloud options um, that if you're working in a government agency, uh, most cloud providers have an option that's exclusive to the government agencies. And that can be very important as well. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Lou. Again, I uh, want to keep on the track of this uh, shared responsibility model. And we're talking about the stability of environments. So uh, if I don't have access or I don't have I don't control my physical infrastructure, how can I ensure that it's going to be safe and that everything's going to be safeguarded? And what happens if there is a disaster? And uh, am I going to lose all my data? I'm going to lose all my services. And again, uh, you really can take advantage of the scale of the cloud in this in this sense. So yes, if you were to architect your solutions poorly, and that's you know that's your portion of the shared responsibility model, uh, you can expose yourself to instability within the cloud infrastructure. So you want to make sure when you're architecting your solutions that you're taking advantage of some of the features that uh, cloud providers have. So in the case of AWS, uh, they've got many regions around the world, uh, dozens of them, and they're constantly adding these regions. And uh, they also then have within those regions many different availability zones. These are geographically distinct areas within those geographically distinct areas. And finally, within those, they have data centers, and these are where your actual machines live. So if you want to make sure that you don't, uh, you aren't uh, hit by a disaster and you, you, know, you lose all your data, you lose all of your uh, compute, or you lose access to your systems, you can architect solutions that mitigate for that. And in that way, you know, the cloud can be way more scalable or, and way more secure and stable than any on-premise solution could ever be um, if you take advantage of this cloud. And that means you just got to architect it carefully and if you go to the next slide we can have a look here and you can see yeah we can go and we can make sure if we if we need if we have a global team and we want this highly available environment we want to make sure that we've got uh our 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 systems uh, mirrored across many different regions so that means if uh something happens in the oregon region and uh one of the data centers uh, experiences a big outage which can happen um it's okay because we've got a mirrored uh, environment inside of North Virginia. Uh, and so our, our analysts, our data scientists can continue to do their work. Um, you also want to make sure you're setting up disaster recovery effectively uh, so that, you know, if you if you do uh, have one region, still make sure you're backing up your data in separate areas, um, especially if you've got mission critical information in your infrastructure. So 
just making it, you know, just making that point that you know data centers can fail, uh, can fail, um, machines can fail. This is the reality. Uh, cloud providers take advantage of that scale and the expertise they have in house to mitigate against that and reduce that down as much as they can. But it's on you to make sure that you architect solutions that also uh, prevent that as much as possible. Okay, you can go to the next slide, Lou. And yeah, this the just closing remarks then on um, architecting on cloud and the different solutions. Just tying back to again that idea of of scale and uh, you can plan as well as you want and you can build your team out uh, or you can plan your architecture as well as well as you want around your current needs and maybe even project your needs a little bit into the future but uh, oftentimes what we see is uh, people want to be very conservative they're like oh I don't know how this is going to get adopted and then lo and behold because it's such great software um, especially our studio team connect is something that sees a great a lot of adoption once it starts getting circulated within organizations uh, suddenly your demand for those services will spike and so you want to be able to respond to that effectively now if you're using on-premise servers you're using physical infrastructure in your house that means you've got to go and you got to call up uh, your your hardware provider and order new machines and have them shipped to your site and then have your IT team install them and configure them and install the software on them and it's a it's a time lag so you're adding weeks onto your process with cloud, if you're clever and you've uh, automated your deployments in an effective way, which you can do with uh, stuff like uh, cloud formation, it means that yeah, I can I can scale up uh, my 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 uh, architecture as quickly as I want to get get it scaled up and take advantage of that infinite scale in the team. So if you're planning on a lot of scale, um, you know consider that maybe you need to use a clustered approach if you if you think your team's really going to grow, or just uh, just be aware of the different. Uh, uh, the different uh, growth that your team might experience and take advantage of the monitoring that uh, different cloud providers have to monitor that usage. You know, uh, in AWS, you have CloudWatch, you can really monitor that. Uh, monitor that. And uh, our studio professional has uh, inbuilt monitoring, so you can build custom monitoring solutions. But keep a close eye on, on usage patterns and understand when you need to scale it up. And then uh, if you've got a clever architect or a cloud cloud engineer, uh, you can easily scale up your your solutions with without that uh, time lag of uh, ordering and procuring that physical infrastructure. And I think that's the last slide. If you go to the next one, just to highlight that, um, as I mentioned throughout, uh, Procogia are a full service partner with our studio. Uh, what that means for us is it means we're we're licensed to resell uh, the different R Studio products, but we also do uh, training and implementation and configuration of R Studio team environments. So we work with clients to architect their solutions, and we have people then who are qualified and trained to go in and install and configure those solutions and maintain uh, those solutions uh, over a long period of time as teams uh, learn to control their own environments. And that is the end of the presentation, Lou. Great, thanks, Kevin. Um, and just a quick word on our studio. I'm sure you know who our studio is if you're listening to this webinar, but you might know us best through our open source work. Things like creating and maintaining the Tidyverse uh, set of packages to make R easier to use and easier to learn. Shiny applications for creating web-based uh, applications from R. R Markdown uh, to deliver, you know, essentially our notebooks to deliver reproducible interactive R-based reports and presentations and documents, as well as our IDE. And certainly creating and supporting this open source software is and will continue to be our studio's core mission. Uh, in fact, we announced earlier this year that we've reorganized ourselves as a public benefit corporation, which means that now our open source mission, our commitment to this is codified into our business charter. And all our decisions as an organization must balance the interests of all our stakeholders, including our community, our customers, and our employees. But an important point is the pro products that I was talking about at the beginning of the session, our studio team, really fund our open source mission. Uh, so that means by buying our products, not only do you get the tools you need to help scale out your open source data science investments, but you're also helping support the open source data science community. And if you haven't seen it, I strongly encourage you to check out the keynote from JJ, our CEO and founder, um, recorded at the last R Studio Conf, uh, where he talks about our announcement around being a public benefit corporation and really the philosophy 
uh, of who our studio is and where we're going. And of course, in addition to our open source software being used by millions of people every week, we have thousands of active uh, commercial software customers, including 59% of the Fortune 100, and we're trusted by many of the world's leading brands. And so with that, um, you know, Kevin and I'd be happy to answer as many questions as we can in the time remaining. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lou and Kevin. That was really informative. It looks like we have enough time for, for maybe for two, maybe three questions. So I'll go ahead and just dive right in. Um, I'll start off with the first one. I think this is going to be for, uh, it looks like it'll be for Kevin here. And how can you figure out the compute power that you or your team needs if you have not done it before, if you're just getting started? That's a really good question. And uh, there, I, there is guidance on our studio uh, and we actually have a recorded webinar uh, that I think might be shared out as well, uh, Samantha, that goes deeper into uh, the compute power uh, configuration. So we did a, a recorded webinar on architecting your solutions for the cloud, uh, where we deep dive into how you can configure that. <clears throat> um, but there is guidance on the RStudio documentation on the minimum requirements. But I'm going to go ahead and assume that maybe the minimum requirements aren't suitable for you. And so, yeah, if you actually want to get started and you're just interested in, in, in learning how you can do this, uh, how you can kind of get a good estimate, um, we actually have a, a, a free tool that you can go on to. Uh, it's, you can sign up on chorus.procogia.com. And uh, on there, there's an Acuna auto architecture tool. And this allows you to just go in and fill out a form. It's got some basic questions and it'll, spit out then at the end when you submit your form uh, suggested architecture so what machine sizes it recommends based off the input that you give and uh, it's in beta form at the moment uh, my, my engineers would want me to caveat it with that um, so it'll give you a rough estimate definitely don't uh, implement straight away but you know take that as a good first stab and then optimize from there uh, but that could be a really good starting point is you know fill out that questionnaire generate an architecture from that uh, you know, with the different recommended machine uh, sizes and types and uh, architectural diagrams that go along with that. And it even com comes with some Terraform scripts that can help you quick start on AWS if you're if you're interested in AWS as a platform. Um, but uh, other than that, it's a it's really a discussion. It's a, uh, you you got to consider how much RAM you're going to need. Um, you know, if if we're if we're to get into the formulaic part of it, uh, you know, if you've got a lot of um, data that you're processing and you're doing a lot of uh, linear algebra and then RAM requirements are going to be very important. Uh, CPUs are going to be very important if you've got a lot of concurrent users. Um, so there's lots of considerations that go into uh, what are the different specs that you might need inside of your machine. Excellent. Thank you, Kevin. I think that's really helpful. Um, and then one more question. Um, so in the context of sharing code, et cetera, and even the data, um, what are some best practices for working with U.S. government requirements? Um, most of, uh, in this question, they say all of our projects are physically siloed, even in our own VPC, and do not share space. So, Kevin or Lou, what would be some best practices you might recommend here? Uh, I, can, I can actually go uh, give a brief description because uh, we, we have been working with a, a client similar to that recently. Um, and yeah, I, I, I feel the pain. Uh, there is a lot of uh, restrictions on the environments and so <clears throat> uh, thankfully uh, these organizations are are kind of becoming more open to the cloud which makes things easier um, and it really just comes down to uh, I think uh, if you're wor working with government data uh, most cloud providers as I mentioned have a government cloud option where the servers are completely isolated from the public infrastructure so only government agencies have access to this so um, you might want to utilize one of those if you're moving to the cloud and as far as like sharing data information, um, we've actually been helping a client uh, come up with a, a virtual clean room scenario. So uh, as you mentioned, you know, how can you keep, how can you isolate data and code and stuff like that uh, from, from people? Because you don't want everybody to have access to that data. You don't want to have everybody access to your proprietary code. And there's a lot of uh, privacy that concerns there. Um, so you can utilize something like uh, Kubernetes um, to uh, containerize your solutions and Within those containerized solutions, configure all the privacy requirements that you need 
and uh, if you can imagine like a push button exercise where somebody presses a button and it automatically launches a container that has all of the access pre-configured uh, and associated with their profile. Uh, so that's what we call a virtual clean room. So it essentially means that everybody who's working off this environment uh, is completely, you know, they're getting like a fresh clean install, uh, completely unperturbed by anybody else's sessions. And so it's completely independent of everybody else and it's, it's only been used by them and it only has access to the data that their profile should allow them to have access to. So that's that's one way we're looking at uh, helping clients at the moment. And uh, one of the best practices, yeah, that I, I can see right now uh, are future best practices. It's a, it's a really exciting project.